I wonder if this was written like during the time of like where people were talking about Final Fantasy VIII, like, or if this was maybe years five later. or six years later, not yeah. 20, 30 years later yeah. after this same team has gone to make like a billion games about fate. <laughs> <laughs> a good point. <laughs> so his like rejection of, of this idea that fate is like the real theme of the game would be con <laughs> would be called into question by the fact that every game they make is about fate. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> So have you ever actually read the Squall is Dead theory? <laughs> have I read it? No, I have Do not. You, have you, like, there's a whole website. I, I, I have read about it. I have not read the in-depth. The there in -depth. is an entire website by uh -huh. the guy, I think, who created the theory. Okay. And it's lengthy. Okay. <laughs> it well, goes it would, it into great to detail be. Okay, okay. about this theory. Um, there are actually two Final Fantasy VIII fan theories that are quite extensive. Okay. Um, to the point to which they, they've they gone to Yoshinori Kitase and asked him directly to like confirm or deny them yeah. because they were convincing enough to, I guess, the larger FF8 okay. fan base that it, it merited that kind of questioning. <laughs> and knowing Kitase, he wouldn't do it. Well, no, he, he basically denied them both. But oh, okay. he also said... But the Squall is Dead theory is really interesting. If we were ever to remake Final Fantasy VIII, I might go in with that in mind. Okay. I am now mad. I am actively <laughs> mad at the person who came up with that theory now. <laughs> because you just gave fodder to the people who want to change, change everything. <laughs> and you just gave them an idea. So when we did our Final Fantasy VIII series, which was the very first podcast series yeah. that we did yeah. uh, in this format... Um, we we had sort of teased doing an episode we on did. the fan theories, yeah. and so now is now is the time. <laughs> four three years later, now years is the later? time to actually do that. Um, That's great. So yeah, um, th this entire website. I mean, there's just okay. a ton of freaking like explanation so, for like uh, describing what this is all about. So I wanted to go through this and maybe a little bit of the Ultimicia and Renoa are the oh. same person theory. Oh gosh. And get your thoughts on I them. gotta dig up my my <laughs> thinking from three and a half years ago. I should be able to do it though. I should be able to do it. Um so did he die during the course of the game or has he been dead from the beginning? Okay. So here the idea is at the end of disc one where you know where Sorcerer's Day like stabs him with like the yes. ice shard yes. that he dies there. There, and not everything, Cypher. Cypher didn't kill him. No. Day everything that him. happens after that in the whole rest of the game is some kind of dream sequence. Very. Is the very like basic Kay. surface level Kay. explanation or summary of what this theory is. However, where it gets interesting is in the details. So I kind of wanted to go through some of that and uh, and get your thoughts on that. And and actually, sure. the Ultima Ultimicia is um, Renoa or from the future or yeah. whatever. That one's also got a few points. And I say this as somebody who does not like fan theories. I mean, we explained that in the uh, yes. in the podcast. <laughs> yeah, many it's times. Like, we could do this. We could do an episode on this, maybe. But like, I don't like it because. Yeah. Of things like the guy coming out and be like, no, that's not it. But <laughs> you, you I'm going to now you, use you, it you in the remake. Whole, you make a whole website. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> where you explain what this game you, really you means. You invest a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> and then the guy just comes and shoots it down. Yeah. So, I mean, this happened. Uh, there was a lot of disappointment on Final Fantasy 15 with a lot of theory crafting channels out there mm, who came right. up with, I, I would assume in their estimation, better story than explanations the <laughs> than the actual one. That's always the risk there, man. That's the risk. <laughs> yeah, so generally we don't do this. But I, I figured for this game in particular, since mm -hmm. we've already done a podcast on it, we haven't gone back to it in a while. Yeah, it's been a bit. That it would be fun to sort of read through some of this and uh, see what we feel in terms... Because Final Fantasy VIII, an, uh, it's a game that has some... I hate the term plot holes, but it has some issues yeah. of consistency and right. of l logic <laughs> with its plot. Hey, man, that was back when they developed a game in one year. So, yeah, I exactly. mean, it comes I, with the territory, but I, I prefer it that way <laughs> than now, where it's like spend 10 years making a game and then you, it's still not finished. And yes. It's like, just give me the one year timeline if you're yes. not going to finish a game anyways. Right. So... So this game is interesting from that perspective because I think a lot of these things were – they were invented for the purpose of helping to make the story make more sense or feel more consistent 
Yeah. And so, so the people they can, can be justify to justify to their friends why, why they, they why like the game this is game. great. It, <laughs> they, you don't need to do that. This is the since the dawn of time. Yes. Like man's greatest uh, uh, goal or is to yeah. justify why they like something why or believe like something. something. Yes, exactly. And and that this is, is all post hoc reasoning. Yes. But yes. <laughs> it's epic phenomenal. It, 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 you don't really have much of a choice in the decision to like something it just happens but the post anyway yes the post hoc but, reasoning goes into it and then you then you justify why you like it but guys it's okay it's okay to just like stuff just it's like okay it. to like what you like and to just like not care that it's got some <laughs> small problems you know it's okay it is just okay. like it it's all good all right so let's get started here okay um the theory at the end of disc one, Squall and friends face Idea on a parade float in Delling City. After Boring. a fight, so far I hate this theory. <laughs> this <is> garbage. <laughs> I remember going through this. There were there were a lot of things about this whole scene we didn't like. But okay. Um, after the fight, when Idea seems defeated, she conjures an enormous ice shard and propels yep. it through Squall's chest. Yep. I mean, it's pretty intense. Squall yep. uh, stumbles back and falls off the platform. He sees Renoa above, reaching. Uh, to him as he falls, Squaw closes his eyes and dies. The entire remaining game from the beginning of disc two to the second half of the ending movie is a dream. Okay, so it is his death dream or is this his um, other world, like his journey, his spirit's journey on the other side to you know finding, what? you know what I'm saying? You know what? Like, are we being all I, rational, Based on the fact or? that since having done that podcast yeah. series, we have done Jacob's Ladder. I would like to at <laughs> least keep in mind the idea that this yeah. could be a death dream because this is right. something I actually only learned semi-recently. Hmm. When a person dies, there's like a huge amount of DMT yeah, that is released DMT. in the brain. That is actually, and evolutionarily speaking, that's actually very hard to explain. Yes. Because why, it almost seems like a, what would you call it? A, a tender mercy, you yes, could say. To that ease. life to ease your passing <laughs> that has no evolutionary utility other than as you're dying. You, but th that's not even evolutionary utility because you're not yeah, passing that on. Right, exactly. So it's like, why does that happen? It's almost yeah. like, um, you know, a tender mercy from, from yeah. Well, from, from dot, dot, from dot, 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 question mark. From what? From, from, from whence? Because it shouldn't be there. That shouldn't be the case. Yeah. Evolution, nature does not give a fly and flip whether or not you are painful when you die, right? Yeah. It just cares about whether or not you passed on the genes and did you not do it? Okay, I'm, I don't care about you. Yeah, right. But it sounds like, it seems like something that a somebody who does care would do. Sure. Um, on, the, on the flip side of that, there's, uh, I know some people, um, friends and family and whatnot who like really get into stories of um, like uh, after death or near death um, experiences. Near death experiences. Yeah, yeah. I've heard those. They're also and, different um, though. They, it's, they are. it's really hard to find a common thread among all of them. The common There's thread something. is that it's DMT. <laughs> oh, there you go. I love it. That's so good. <laughs> the, the common thread is they're having what is essentially a, a psychedelic dream. experience. Yeah. That but, is but naturally the thing, caused here's... by the release of all this DMT. No, you're right. No, but once again, DM, what, what exactly our relationship is with everything sure. is not entirely clear. Yeah. Because some of these near-death experiences um, will describe things like miles away. Yeah. And say, this is what you said. This is what was happening. Yeah. This is what. And it's like, we weren't even near you. Right. How do you know that? Um and so option one, they're all lying. <laughs> but option two is that there's something else weirder going on. Well, there's, I mean, I, I as a, as just being close to these people and, and, and uh, getting into it a little bit, there's yeah. definitely a lot of near death experiences that are very hard to explain yeah, where there, yeah. they are basically totally dead. Let's say for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And they can wake up. And tell the doctors things that happened when they were totally flatlined. Yeah, totally. So I'm not trying to and say. And from like a third person perspective. But here's yes. the thing can a normal psychedelic experience produce similar results? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but, or, or how can the brain be processing any of the stuff that they would, their brain That's, would then take yeah, with the DMT? Because protein synthesis if, isn't happening. If, if they're dead. I yeah. mean, like for sure dead. Well, like we but, talk about memory formation with protein synthesis, yes. and that protein Process synthesis is not happening. Is not happening while yes. um while you're not working yes. while your brain is is not so you shouldn't even if you did your brain did uh, perceive something you should not be able to remember it yes. afterwards so i'm not saying this as some means of dismissing 
uh, any validity or legitimacy to yeah, real yeah. near death experiences that were like the person's totally dead and they remember things. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying a lot of near death experiences are, are trips. Are, are near death experiences? <laughs> yeah, are trips, and I think yeah. that's probably basically the common experience, or right? Yeah, that people have. You're going to see things. You're going to s- things from your past, and this was all kind of explored in Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, the, the when, and we, the we analyzed thing. that film. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, looking at it from that lens, uh, what, what Squall is happening, what's happening with Squall here might be this type of thing. Mm. Some of the weirdness, particularly of the ending of the game, could be worked into that, and and I don't know, maybe it will help people's head canon in sort of making this uh, game make a little more sense. But <laughs> it's a good game; you don't have to do this. <laughs> Sorry, we're doing it. Let's go. We're doing Carry it anyways. On. So he goes on to say, uh, yes, a dream, a fantasy, a vision, whatever you want to call it. The dream is basically an extension of the your life flashes before your eyes concept. So you know, mm. kind of what he's talking about. The okay. entire dream takes only a matter of seconds, but for Squall, it passes in real time. Yep. And so, that is a thing. Uh, psychedelics yeah. can do that. They can lengthen time. They totally do. And dreams do that, too. Like, you can have a dream that you think you've lived, like, a year. And it had, yeah. <laughs> it was like, uh, that was, like, you know, 10 minutes. I've had that experience many times. Yeah, me too. For Squall, it's about the endless possibilities he could have realized. Squall explores the questions that were raised on the first disc, but he was not able to answer in his lifetime. These questions include, but are not limited to, who is the sorceress Sorceressidale? Yes. What are her goals and motivations? Where do her powers come from? Why was Cypher in the parade with Idea when he was reported executed? Like all these things that the game gives answers to. Later, yeah. You, you, you're now operating under the assumption that it's just Squall trying to wrestle yeah. with this in death. And those answers are just his <laughs> answers until he finds peace in time compression yeah, and all this stuff. Exactly. Huh. Um, <laughs> who was the girl alone? Right, the mysterious Alone. girl who came right at the very yeah. beginning of the game and looks at him through the window when he got his is star. That, that's not the girl that we rescue from the T Rex, is that right? Um, yes, that it is. It was. It is. It yes. Was. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. Who is Laguna, and why did? I mean, it's so funny because like, but he's having he, dreams about Laguna, right? Yes. Okay, so these are so yes. he's dreaming about dreams. Yes. Yeah. Okay, he, okay, he's okay, trying gotcha. to find out what was that weird. <laughs> uh, mushroom like mushroom DMT experience I had in the real, and now that I'm having this natural it's, it's DM, again. DMT yeah. experience in death, who was that guy? <laughs> Why did that happen? Okay, I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. And most importantly, who is Squall? Who were his parents? Why did they leave him at the orphanage? Where does he come from? And what would he have done with his life had he not died? So. Probably the most criticized aspect of Final Fantasy VIII mm. is the orphanage scene where they reveal that all these characters grew up together and they just yeah. forgot that. And they got brought um, together. A big part of what we were doing when we were analyzing that game was saying, hey, this seems like it comes out of nowhere yeah. if you're not going out of your way to talk to NPCs, read mm. files in like the school desk oh, yeah. like computer yeah, yeah. and things like that where they drop a lot of hints that make that not feel so out of left field because mm. they are equipping the gfs and the act of the doing GFs that lose memory, there yeah. was tons of right. material that basically like research material that suggested it erases your memories right so it is in the very act of playing the game using gfs that squall is forgetting what is revealed in that scene So as long as you're seeing that stuff in the early game, it's not going to feel like, what the heck, this explanation's crazy and it makes no sense and it comes out of nowhere. Yeah, Uh, They just don't really plant it in the story. They kind of plant it around the plot. Right. And so anyway, but in this case, he's dead. So he's trying to make sense of all of, (laughs) who am I, where did I come from uh, kind of stuff. So it, it, it goes, I think this theory exists to sort of, explain some of those things in a way that might feel more convincing or natural as this uh, near-death DMT experience versus it. No, that literally happened. Okay. Which is kind of what Jacob's Ladder is. Like the stuff that happens in that is like weird. Yeah, it's weird. And there's a weird, there's a strange thing about Jacob's Ladder, which is that 
e- even that his whole life was like not real yeah. and that even like the kid wasn't real. It was just that song that he heard and he was like, oh yeah, I have a kid or whatever. Yeah. And then he just kind of made it up. I don't like the theory. I think it's dumb. <laughs> I think, uh, but it's entirely possible that is what technically happened, you know? Sure. It's just not the meaningful aspect yeah. of Jacob's Ladder. Right. Um, but there would be something like that here too, I'm sure. Yep. So he goes into the section here, the standard interpretations of the story. So this is what people generally, I mean, this is what is generally accepted as like the real version of the story, right? Today's understanding of the events of Final Fantasy VIII comprise of a mixed bag. Most people focus on who Ultimicia is, what her motives are, and what happens after her defeat. This has led to the misinterpretation of the evidence and symbolism pointing towards Squall's death. So that's one thing I should probably say about this. Mm. The dude is speaking very authoritatively here. And this yeah. was done many, many, many years ago. This okay. whole site like was created. So it can come across as a little bit condescending or like, uh, no, I really know <laughs> what the story is about. And you guys secret, don't know. The secret gnosis. Yeah. He's been initiated. Exactly. Yeah. It can sound a little bit like that. <laughs> yeah. So just bear that in mind and kind of, you know, okay. give the give him a little bit of leniency with that. Okay. Um, some evidence that formerly appeared to be vague and inconclusive now represent clear allusions and references to the subtlety of Final Fantasy VIII's obscured meaning. Okay, it's one thing to come up with a cool theory, but it's another thing to be like, oh, they were hinting at it the yes, whole time, right. all along. This is what they were really saying. Yes. And then they say no. Yes. Because <laughs> it's, 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 it's better to craft like a theory or to do some fan fiction or to be like, hey, this could mean this or that. Um, yeah. It's a whole different thing when you're, you're in their heads and you're like, I cracked their code and then they just tell you no. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if, sad, if you're going to come out this confidently yeah. and authoritatively <laughs> on like telling people what it's really about, and then the dude's like, "Yeah, definitely not," but it's kind of cool theory. I mean, there maybe yeah. there's maybe there's the silver lining in the fact that he was like that might yeah. be more interesting to explore in some theoretical remake or whatever. But it it does sort yeah. of quash this. Sure, you could call it like pomp that he's sort of yeah. presenting all of this with, but whatever. I'm going to look past that. (laughs) That's fine. Uh, In fact, the popular opinion of Final Fantasy VIII falls exactly in line with the nature of the elements of the plot that are consistent within the dream theory and those that are not. For instance, one of the biggest criticisms of the game is that the orphanage plot twist appears to be completely random and come out of nowhere. It appears to be too convenient for how could all the main characters have possibly grown up together in the same orphanage. The brilliance of the dream theory is that it addresses concerns like these and offers a logical explanation. So now we're going to get into supporting evidence. Because everything has to be logical. (laughs) It's fine. It's fine. Well, there is, there's one, I do have one thing to say real quick. Yeah, I, I think I know where you're going with this, and I think it's a good thing to say. Uh, you you say your thing first then, actually. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think what you're going to say, uh, what I think you're going to say, I don't know what you're going to say, is okay. a good thing to, to bring up about storytelling in general. Yes, in general. Yeah. You, trying to be just hyper-rational about stories is a good way to just, like, not enjoy stories. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. I think that's it. If you're trying to make sure that everything has to always make logical sense and be perfectly rational and and... Uh, always be completely self-consistent. Even though your life isn't that, you aren't that, no one you know is that, nothing that ever happens around you is that. It, you just happen to live in a world that probably has some underlying laws and truth to it, but that we're still trying to figure them out, basically, mm-hmm. in terms of science and whatnot. Uh, but in the world of art, you know, like you you bend the rules, you know, and yeah. trying to make everything be rigid and logically consistent all the time is a is a pretty good way to to ruin the experience of art. Yeah, not only from the consumer side, but even from the writing side. Like, um, I know yeah. I've gotten like <clears throat> super bogged down in that, and so like stuck. the technical details. Yeah, just and, making yeah. sure everything's explained. Everything has um, like a, a a logical sort of like rule based explanation for it, or yeah. a historical uh, uh, you know sort of precedent upon which this culture does this yeah. or that. Like, sure. I think Tolkien has set a precedent yeah. <laughs> for that to some degree because of how linguistically driven he was in the whole creation of his yeah. myth. But he still has plenty of mysteries sure. and unanswered sure. questions and things that kind of don't make a ton of sense, but yeah. that are just that attract you. They draw you, you yeah. know, because right. you want to know, but you don't know what the answer is. Right. So, you know, there, there's definitely a balance there. I mean, you want, you want to create a convincing world that people mm. can get lost in, but you don't want to get so bogged down in it that you sort of lose the fun or that you never finish the thing because you can't ever, which is not possible. You cannot ever 
make a perfectly logical, consistent world. It's yeah, just not yeah. going to happen. Um, and that's not the point. Well, many the, would say it doesn't happen in the real world right. either. Yeah, like quant, quantum mechanics <laughs> is what Albert Einstein said about quantum mechanics because he was like, it, it may well be true. I think he was talking to Schrodinger or somebody like that. Yeah. And he was like, it may well be true. But it's stupid and ridiculous, and I hate it. Right? Like, even if you if you're right, then I think what he said was like, God does not play dice, is what Einstein said. Like, yeah. like it doesn't make sense that these you know random anyways the the way quantum mechanics works just in general, uh, it throws a question. It kind of stabs at the whole like logical premises of everything kind of mm -hmm. stuff, and it's something that a lot of scientists, Einstein himself in particular, really had a hard time getting past because yeah. he was like, "This is stupid. This means that well, a mean, lot of the laws of reality are kind of tenuous." Yeah, a when bit. when you're when you're a guy who almost creates a perfect system, like yeah. mathematically to explain yes, the macro exactly. universe. Yeah. And then all of that comes into question with this right. entire subfield. Right. Yeah. I, I, I could see a, a hesitancy to sort of accept that. But he knew he agreed. He's like, yeah. this is correct. And it undoes a lot of my work, but it, there's, it can't be true. Like it can't, <laughs> it can't be real. There's gotta be something else. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. So, yeah, I agree. Um, at some point, you know, again, there's balance. At some point, though, you kind of got to just get past it. This is fake anyways, and that's right. not the point. The point's not to be perfectly logically consistent. The point yeah. is to create some sort of uh, archetype, some sort of yeah. facsimile, not like facsimile, a, um, but simile of yeah, yeah. Uh, some sort of point, some sort of message I have in mind, to, and, and to explore that through to conclusions and and sort of say something about that and see yeah, what to make a meaningful think. yeah observation point yeah. something okay supporting evidence oh let's hear it so number one you've become just a memory is a quote from the game i don't remember where that comes from Ooh, very just gonna find out how would he know that if he thought he's in, <laughs> in the latter half of disc one Two conversations take place concerning cypher's fate and if he will be executed for attacking the president of Galbadia. so Remember, there's that scene where he was like holding the president yeah. hostage yeah, in the TV. Yeah, live TV. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. So he apparently was he was supposed to be supposed to have been executed for this. Mm -hmm. um, during these sections of dialogue, Squall muses to himself on the existential qualities of death. Will they talk about me this way if I die too? No, oh, I remember so, this. I remember this. Squall yeah. was uh, Squall was this and that using the past tense, saying whatever they want. And then he gets all mad. No, yeah. no one's going to talk about yes. me in past tense. Yes, I remember exactly. this. This is so good. Exactly. In this manner, Squall considers his own death and what little difference it will make for the world. This serves as foreboding, an ominous suggestion to the viewer that ill times are ahead. But I, I do have a question, though, because, like, okay, Squall is dead. Does Squall know that he's dead? Because this no, suggests not. this suggests that, that he that he, know that. that he knows, maybe right? Or is I, he is he in know. denial? That could be a thing <laughs> where it's like you, you yeah, part I, of you knows your unconscious mind knows, yeah. But then you're like Jacob's ladder does this yeah. a little bit. Like you fight at against some it. point, yeah. But you're just fighting it, yeah. I okay. Yeah, I, I would go possible. with that direction. Probably a, probably a fighting to reject, but maybe well, he's definitely struggling with intuitively it knowing when he comes out in this emotional outburst of I'm never gonna yeah be he, past tense yeah exactly. Also note this excerpt from the first conversation concerning Cypher's possible execution. So it's in it's in parentheses, so it's like what the person's thinking, right? Yeah. Think what you want. Oh, Reality yeah. isn't so kind. Everything doesn't work out the way you want it to. That's why. And then the actual quote spoken out loud. As long as you don't get your hopes up, you can you can take anything. You feel less mm. pain. Anyway, whatever yeah. wish you have is none of my business. Here Squall states the obvious. Stuff happens. People die, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the way the world is. Everything doesn't work out the way you want it to. Not only is this foreshadowing, but it's also contrary to what some consider a central theme to Final Fantasy VIII's story, fate. We'll come back to this point later. Hmm. Now, I am actually... Th this has sparked something. Because Me too. It sparked several things. He's trying, he's trying to reject the premise that fate... Yeah. Um... Let me read that, that again. The fate is just his rationalization of something. Not only is this foreshadowing, but also contrary to what some consider a central theme to Final Fantasy VIII's story, which is fate. Huh. Fate. But Children of Fate isn't the, the song. Well, is... the, re the reason I'm, my brain started like turning on that is because I wonder if this was written like during the time of 
like where people were talking about Final Fantasy VIII, like, or if this was maybe years five later. or six years later, not yeah. 20, 30 years later, yeah. after this same team has gone to make like a billion games about fate. <laughs> <laughs> a good point. <laughs> so his like rejection of, of this idea that fate is like the real theme of the game would be con <laughs> would be called into question by the fact that every game they make is about fate. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's beautiful. I, I think I, that's beautiful. That's so, beautiful. you know, I, I, it just makes me wonder when he wrote this because, yeah. uh, you know, uh, it, it, quite clearly these, these guys like to talk about fate. Oh, my gosh. Um, you know what uh, this also sounds like, though? In some way, this sounds a little bit like it was something that you had said earlier ab about what he was writing. This sounds like a, a Western materialist trying to explain Buddhism. Sure. That's kind of what this sounds like. Sure, yeah. Where it's like, like oh, good you know, people point. like this undercuts like the whole theory, but you know, I'm trying to make sense of their silly <laughs> worldview or whatever, and it, it's it's kind of funny sometimes. Yeah, That's yeah. Um, number two, so evidence number two, my wound, no wound. So it's like I think when he wakes up on disc two, he's oh, like, he oh, no where's wound. where's the wound? There's no like uh, actual but he did scar. Expect to see. You. Oh, it's because ice melts. That's why there's no wound. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I watched Christmas Vacation, and they were trying oh, to figure out what broke right. the, their, his right. recording That's equipment. That's right. It was That's ice. Right. Um, I haven't seen that movie, so. Oh, it's funny. It's funny. Um, <laughs> I watched it over Christmas. But um, the uh, he knows that there should be a wound there, but there isn't. Is mm -hmm. this is this a dream thing? Like, in dreams, do you, like, um, do you not have scars, or do you see yourself? That's I, possible. I, I suppose. Um well, when that, that would certainly suggest something's off or something's not right. Okay. You expect to see something, but it's not there. Yeah, but in dreams, do you not see things like that? Here's, here's one thing that I learned very recently. Well, somebody brought it up, and I thought, wow, that's totally true. Do you remember your dreams much? Do you have dreams that you remember you know, often? Lately, I have been forgetting them more and more and more, but it's, but it's more, I remember it's one more of the month. process <laughs> of... Um, I remember it like right after waking up, but then it okay. very quickly fades and I yeah. forget. Yeah, um, but I, keep I, a dream I do journal. know that I do. Well, not to suggest that people who don't remember their dreams aren't dreaming because they probably are. Right, but probably I, are. I know that like so. When I say I am dreaming, all I'm saying is I'm remembering that I'm dreaming. But you don't basically know anything every about day. It. Okay. But then I forget it so fast that I couldn't tell you what it is. Okay. Okay. Um, so. Do you recall, have you ever had a dream in which your cell phone appears in the dream? Do you ever dream about... This is almost an Inception type question. This is, because like, here's the thing. Do I have my phone? How often... Is that how you tell if you're dreaming or not? <laughs> Instead of the, the spinning top? That's, can that I pull be... my cell phone out of my pocket? I'm, I'm actually going to pose this question <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> everybody watching. There, there's this, there's this, there's a thing, Okay. People Holy don't dream crap, of cell phones. That's hilarious. People don't dream of cell phones. But how often do you use or check or have all your the phone time. all the time? Yet you yet it never enters your dreams, right? Now there are various theories about why this is the case. Is this so, like is this like this universal? Is a thing. Like well, okay. people are talking about this. I read an I read an article in which a doctor people psychologist are saying yeah they've commentary. literally never dreamed of their phone. I I, I yes. don't think I have. At least I cannot recall ever having dreamed. Of using my cell phone. The thing you always have and use every single day and use more than any other thing ever. That's crazy. You don't ever dream and never enters your dreams. What the right? fuck? So <laughs> it, it's it's wild, right? But this could be a thing where it's like you do you see scars in dreams? Do you mm. is your do you there there may be certain things that you just miss when you're dreaming. You just don't see them, even though you're always around them. You always have them, right? Wow. Everybody is saying never dreamed yeah. of my cell phone before. Okay, People dude. have dreamed of cell phones. It's just not common. It's yes, usually yes, yes. not for. It's usually for calling, not for scrolling, like most people do. Is what six okay? But that's saying. what people use it for. Though. Yeah. So sure. it, like, if you're doing a 1950s whatever, but why are you dreaming about 1950s phones? Why aren't I'm, you dreaming I'm, about a today phone? So I have um, in the past. I haven't actually tried this lately. Yeah. But I I actually got pretty good at one point of um, basically like consciously initiating lucid dreaming. No, oh, you told I, me about this. Where yeah. I could like yeah. control the dream. That's wild. <laughs> now I'm gonna like I'm gonna actually that. try to do this and like force my cell phone into my dream yes. and see if it's possible. That way you'll know the inception <laughs> thing. That way you'll know whether or not you whether should I'm dreaming yeah, or not. Whether you're dreaming or not. Because it's like I've lucid, I've tried, I can never take out my phone That's when I'm dreaming. Freaking funny.
Okay. So anyways, anyways, this could be one of those kinds of things, right? Yeah, Where it's like, sure. oh no, I don't have a scar. I'm dreaming something. Like yeah. That. Because he thinks there should be a scar. Yeah. But I don't okay. know. All right, all right. I would be actually, I would be, oh, I don't know if I should bring this up actually. <laughs> I would be very, I'll just say it and you know, let me know if I'm if you uh, cut a tone deaf. Yeah. Um, I'd be very interested to know if uh, people who have lost limbs dream and, and they have the limbs and in And they dreams. have their limbs in their dreams. Yeah. I'd be very interested to know. Be that. a good question to ask people. I, I don't personally know anybody. I don't, I don't either, think actually. so. But that would be, a good be thing to very look into. interesting to know. My wound, no wound. The attempted assassination of Idea by Seed at Delling City at the end of Disc 1 is where everything starts and ends. Squall engages Idea in cipher in a battle on the parade float. After the battle ends, Idea casts a spell on him. Uh, after the encounter between Squall and Idea, Squall wakes up in a cell in the Galbadian Desert Prison. His first dialogue is, where am I? I challenged Idea. My wound? No wound. How? The Galbadian soldiers, we were surrounded. He was there, Cypher, leering down at me. Damn you, Cypher. Apparently, Squall's healthy and good to go. It is never again referenced directly they in the entire game. They never explain his wound. They never did. That could be the biggest um, <laughs> the biggest hit. Supporting. Uh, that he's dreaming. Theory, uh, uh, supporting evidence. He theory. has no wound, and they never even no one bring even, it up. No one even says again. anything about it. That's the insane. The whole game. I didn't realize that. Um, it is never again referenced directly in the entire game, nor is it ever explained what happened to his wound or how he survived. And remember, you know, a piece of ice half as long as Squall himself went through his chest and came out the other side. Yeah, but th th whoever wrote that has <laughs> never done has never done the Summon Meteor before. And whoever yeah. did that has never played Final Fantasy before. Uh, yeah, because mean. every single battle that crap happens. Every battle. <laughs> like, well, you're, you're playing Final Fantasy VII, and Cloud has been riddled with a thousand bullets by the yeah, time right. you finish the bombing run. And it's like, okay. Or the, the laser, the scorpion yeah. laser. Like, yeah. pfft, it, that thing ought to cut you in half, right? So in terms of games, that, I'm <laughs> There's not... There's literally, like, a house that launches missiles. Yes. And, like, blows up in their face. There's freaking Meteor. <laughs> There's freaking you can summon the god Odin to like smash you and you're now, you're, how did you survive? Okay, to be fair, I know I'm in, mostly in being to, funny. to this guy, I guess. <laughs> um, the the battles of Final Fantasy are typically, I think, more obviously meant to be abstractions, yes, than say things like this in the narrative are, but. That is fair. That is fair. <laughs> However, I've seen way worse in Final Fantasy. I'm just throwing that yeah. out there. And you, and here's the funny thing about this. If he never referenced, oh, my wound isn't there. Oh, so weird. No wound. And then they, the weird thing is that he referenced it. If yes. he never referenced it, we would never have even batted an eye. Yeah, because like, it. oh, Final Fantasy, everyone gets stabbed a thousand times with ice in Final Fantasy. Nobody ever dies from it unless your HP hits zero. And then yes. you use a Phoenix down, you're good. Um, but the fact that he brought it up is weird. Yes. And then it never and gets brought up again. And then it never gets brought up again. Yeah, yeah that's wild. Uh, most players seem to assume that Adea healed Squall to full health for the purpose of interrogation. But why would she? Cypher knows that Squall is no great captain from Balam Garden. He's no more privy to top secret information than are the other three. If Adea wanted to know more about Seed, she should be interrogating Kistus, or Quistus, who's mm. been a Seed for three years and who has been teaching Seeds for one year. Squall has been a seed for all of two weeks. Why go through all the effort of killing him just to bring him to full health when he's obviously a threat or, or obviously not a threat to her or obviously is a threat to her? I'm not sure what she means by that. But anyway, the point being, there are other people they could interrogate. She didn't need to bring him back to life and perfectly healed just to interrogate him. Because that's what happens. That's what the, the scene where he's like electrocuted and stuff by Cypher. Yeah, and yeah. And those funny little like teddy bear dudes. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, evidence number three. Again, a quote. I don't know what's going on anymore. As some of you may have noticed, the plot takes a few unanticipated turns after the end of disc one. At first, the transition is rather subtle. When plot twists are introduced, they are fully explained. Um, he has a little bit of a, a grammar mistake here, so I'm trying to see if I'm reading it right. They're fully explained and are not in conflict with existing plot information. In fact, the more you learn about this world, the more everything seems to make perfect sense. Everything fits together in an elaborate but perfectly designed puzzle. <laughs> okay. Everything connects and everything is related, and yet it still seems absolutely ridiculous. The story takes on a dreamlike quality it that does. centers this itself 
on Squall this and everything Squall has ever wanted. So this is actually a good point. Well, maybe it's not. <laughs> I just thought about it. <laughs> Squall's the main character. Of course, the game is centered on his point of view. But it is interesting that maybe what he's going to make a case for here is that in the disc one, you got a little bit more of like other perspectives from other characters, sure, whereas this sure, com yeah. becomes more centered on like the things that he stated to have believed, wanted, thought about okay. in a way that makes it seem more like this is this could only be happening in his own mind, right? So the story takes on a dreamlike quality that centers itself on Squall and everything Squall has ever wanted. The dream goes on to explain everything Squall wanted to know, but it also treads through the realm of egoist fantasy. It spins off into a world of impossible where monsters come from the moon and Squall, merely a newly recruited cadet, goes on to save the world as we know it from an evil sorceress from the future. Yeah. And he gets the girl. But this is every but Final Fantasy. But that's every Final Fantasy. <laughs> I mean, that's every story. It's every RPG. It's every anime. Yeah, it's every story. Yeah. Let's look at some specific examples. So A, one word, Moombas. As soon as I saw those red lion Pokemons running around on the screen, I knew there was something strange happening. <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> the first disc had a fairly high level of realism, despite the fantasy and low sci-fi topics present. The characters were all human, and outside of monsters, there were no unearthly creatures to be seen. Where Noah had a dog that attacks for her at times, as uh, earthly as dogs are known to do. Um, but there weren't any fluffy feline creatures running around yelling, Laguna, Laguna. Dude, there's like freaking T-Rexes though. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And that's in disc one. Yeah. So this is uh this is that kind of world, <laughs> right? Dinosaurs. Yeah. And like there's all kinds of weird things. What are you talking about? <laughs> of course, Moombas are explained within the context of the game. In the Shumi village, you can learn who the Moombas are, who they evolve from, and so on and so forth. That's game, I've never understood that. Yeah. The game takes the plot uh, developments of the dream very seriously and treats them as truth which makes the dream theory especially difficult to argue. Sure, all this stuff seems weird, but how do, you, how do we know that it's all intended to be a dream? Um, maybe the creators just thought it'd be cool to have talking cats around, and who knows, maybe they did. So I guess he's making the arguments of the opposition. Yeah, how, do you, yeah. how does that prove that? How do you know that that's what they intended kind of thing? Yeah. Um, but I think it's more than convenient that the more fantastical elements, such as talking lions, do not appear in the game until after the moment where Squall may have died. Now I'm trying to remember. That's fine, I guess. I'm trying to remember how true that is because I don't recall ever seeing one. I mean, before. I brought up the dinosaur example, but dinosaurs yeah. existed in real life. So it's not like <laughs> it's not necessarily some fantastical creature or something like that. Right, but, but there like, are fantastical creatures. I mean, I'm trying to remember in disc 1 though. Yeah, I mean, the you monsters fight, like, you fight. I mean, stuff? there's Ifrit, there's GFs. Yeah. Uh, those are fantastical, Definitely, I <laughs> certainly think. fantastical I mean, creatures. Yeah, I don't know if I'm, I'm not if I'm following him on this point. Huh. This doesn't seem to be a very good argument. Uh, Fushururu, three Ooh. seconds are up. Oh, okay. We already covered the Moombas and the Shumi, but I wanted to say the master of the garden is a giant yellow sloth alien creature. He thinks that this is too weird. Oh. Right? This is more evidence of it being dreamlike. Yeah, just let things be weird. Don't don't <laughs> feel the need to just explain it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but this is uh, typical dream material, in my opinion. <laughs> of course, Norg and uh, his kind are fully explained in the game. Okay, yeah, we get it. When walking around the garden in the beginning of the game, you often see the cult-looking guys in red robes wandering right. about, sometimes yeah. conversing with you. I more than once thought they looked a bit creepy, though, and I can easily imagine that Squall would have thought the same and integrated their possible backstory into his dream. I'm not even going to read any more about that. I don't okay. think it's a good point. Yeah, I don't think so. No, this one. Perhaps it's fate. And we're back to the fate question. What I wanted to point out on the subject of fate and destiny and all that hullabaloo is simply this. The subject of fate does not come up until after the end of disc one. The word fate comes up only once on the first disc, when Squall and friends get the last train for Delling City moments before it disembarks. Irvine comments on the luck by saying, hmm, perhaps it's fate. After the first disc of the game, however, fate comes a frequent 
uh, comes up as a frequent subject of conversation. It seeds destiny to defeat sorceresses. It squalls fate to lead garden. Squalls destined to face cipher, etc. Fate becomes such a prevalent topic that many players come away feeling that fate was one of the most important elements of Final Fantasy VIII's story and the answer mm -hmm. to all the questions. Fate is the reason why this lowly cadet instantaneously became the leader of Garden. I mean, that that is actually kind of a good point, not to, to validate the theory, but the fact that he was made into, um, like, the leader of the whole Garden as, yeah. like, a new cadet, like a new seed. Now, right. that's, that's, an ego, that's egoist dream fantasy. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what the point he's making, right? Yeah. right? Like, that's silly. Right. But in... If, if, if again, the story is that it's a time loop, so like he's faded to it because in the time loop, he's the one that defeats Sorceress Idea. So, right. since he is, then of course they they know that, <laughs> so they make him in put him in a position where he can do it, right? Because of, um, but that yeah. sounds like a teenager's egoist fantasy, <laughs> yes. not like real life. I think is the point he's making, I which like, um, I think is valid. Uh, Minty Mira commented on our Discord and says, uh, yeah, we don't see any hints of fate anywhere in disc one with rolly eyes. And it's basically um, alone talking to Squall as he's laying on the hospital uh, bed. So we saying, meet again. Squall, so we meet again. Da, da, da. <laughs> and then she leaves. That that may not say the word fate, but it's yeah. clearly hinting at that uh, a coincidence of fates, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here's the next one. Just stay close to me. The next line of dialogue he's using is evidence. Speaking of a perfect fantasy, the romantic storyline of Final Fantasy VIII is just that, the romantic plot line, which many fans consider the most successful element of the game. Hmm. It's completely fabricated for Squall's personal satisfaction. Not only does Renoa show little appreciation for Squall through disc one, but there are many allusions to her ongoing relationship with Cypher. I think this guy struggles with the idea well, there that plots some... develop yeah, past yeah. the first act. <laughs> I, I I have some thoughts. I, I do have some thoughts, but I just don't think I should say them. They aren't very kind. Thumper said I shouldn't I shouldn't say stuff if it's not very kind. So you can't say something nice, say nothing at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because I, I, I'm learning more, I'm learning not much about Final Fantasy VIII from listening to this person talk, but I'm learning a lot about this person yeah. and what they consider to be normal and yeah, acceptable. Right. And um, I would consider that this is a framing problem uh, on the end of this human and yeah. not so much on the other end it, it, where he's it's pointing like, it. It's like, and again, I don't know if this guy is like around or like watching or whatnot. I mean, it's possible, I suppose. I have no idea who he is or where he is or what he's doing these days or yeah. if he's still around or whatever. But um, I think you've just said something that to me makes a lot of sense. Like sometimes we can get kind of sort of caught up in a single like paradigm of thinking, like our own yeah. perspective on things. And you have to force everything to fit, to fit into that. Into your little box that you yeah. made. Yeah. Th th this does come across a little bit that way to yeah. me um whereas you get a perspective from someone else i mean plots don't put like every every piece of foreshadowing or every explanation yeah, yeah. In, in act right one yeah, yeah like some of these things are going to be introduced in yeah. two three because you introduce intrigue as things build and you learn new yeah. things and that's normal so that 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 that, that doesn't that does not that's not evidence no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway um but uh, let's keep going here. In the ballroom scene, okay, so that I'm going to actually skip that. So he's basically saying the romance that it wasn't there as much. Uh, it sounds seems to him like something a teenage boy would again incorporate into this egoist fantasy as he's okay. dying. It doesn't like that. Does explain. really make sense that this girl would all of a sudden start liking him, which is something a lot of people bring up. Again, I think he's I constructing all these arguments as yeah. counterpoints to the criticisms of the story. Yes, yes, Why yes, yes, is yes. Renoa into this guy? We had yeah. a whole, I think, long segment on one of the episodes right. where we talked about that, and I think we had some yeah, really good perspectives. Uh, we, we called out to our female viewers to like give us perspective yeah, on yeah. this. And uh, so there's definitely more explanations than just... Yeah, he, girl, he, he girls didn't think, really girls think Squall's dope. <laughs> yeah, like... Yeah, uh, but um, it seems from his point of view that it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for her to like be way into him like this when he's 
treated it, her the way he did. And it is strange, but this is something that every movie does and yeah. every game does. Yeah. This is Aladdin. This is like there, there's there are so many stories and games that let you live out first a power fantasy, second some like sexual um, icon fantasy. Yeah. That I, singling this one game out and saying that this doesn't make sense is. It's a little bit, a little bit silly, yeah. I think. Okay, we're moving on now to f number four, which is the ending. At the very end of the game, just as you're beating the final boss, Ultimecia, she starts to say some strange things, statements that appear very out of context for a final battle. That is Reflect true. on your childhood, your sensation, your words, your emotions. Time, it will not wait. No matter how hard you hold on, it escapes you. When I read those words, a chill ran up my spine, or when I read those words. <laughs> With every attack, you bring down Ultimecia's hit points, and you bring Squall's dream to a close. Squall, oblivious, fights on, and only his, this figment of his imagination seems aware of what's happening. There's a short story segment here involving Squall going back in time to the orphanage and seeing Ultimecia pass on her powers to Idea in the past. Then Squall leaves in search of his own time, and is shown wandering in the desert. He appears to be lost in time and unable to find his way back to his normal time period. Right, right. Squall finds himself on a small rock island, isolated and helpless. He drops himself to the ground, exhausted. Then, upon catching a feather floating toward him, he finds himself where Renoa is. He calls out her name, and she turns to face him. This is where the weird stuff starts happening. Renoa turns to Squall, but her face is blurred, there's a shot of Cypher as the movie cuts to the ballroom scene. Here we see Renoa again and again. She turns towards the camera as she did in the ballroom scene on disc one, but she's blurry and messed up again. The mm. shot continues to repeat, and every time Renoa's face and form are blurred, and the effect seems to be getting worse each time. What is happening here? It is my belief that, okay, finally... Finally, he said the thing that he should have been saying those lines. It, it is, is my, my belief, personal belief. Not, it was the intention of the developers that. <laughs> Squall's dream <clears throat> is coming to a close. He's starting to lose touch with his own memories. He's trying to picture Renoa, the object of his fantasy, but he can't quite remember the shape of her face. Right. He's going over that moment in the ballroom where he first saw her again and again in his mind, focusing closer on, what her, on her face and trying to see her the way that she was. I have seen this specific visual symbolism once before in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless yes, Mind. Yes, yes, I actually... We're just thinking yes, that? I, well, I thought about it when well, we when did we this podcast, game, I thought, yeah. and I may have actually even brought it up, but yeah. uh, we didn't go into it much. That would be a fun movie to, to I, I think to we do. probably will at some yeah. point talk about that one. Very good. In Eternal Sunshine, the protagonist, Joel, has his memory erased because, well, I guess, spoilers for this movie. Um, mm, yeah. Because I've seen the movie, but if Jim, anybody else hasn't and you want to see it without spoilers, he wants to forget his ex-girlfriend. But in the course of the, the procedure, Joel realizes that he's losing uh, and tries to hold on to those precious memories. So he, like, has second thoughts about it as it's right. happening. Yeah. He tries to remember the things uh, they have already erased just to find the characters in his memory are faceless, blurred beyond recognition. As Squall is visualizing Renoa in the ballroom, we start to see some quick shots interrupting the movie. The first one, as I already mentioned, was of Cypher. What is noteworthy about the shot of Cypher is that it shows him in the torchlight from the parade float where Idea tried to kill Squall with an ice spell. So the, the, the image of Cypher he sees at the ending, is the one right before he died. Oh. That's the image of Cypher that comes from not oh, any okay. that happens after or whatever. Right, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Then some quick shots of Renoa appear. These are as blurred as the Renoa from the ballroom scene, but these images of Renoa come from the scene where Idea makes her speech before the parade. Renoa, who appears to be under Idea's spell, follows the sorceress out uh, to see the screaming crowd. So all the images he's seeing that he's trying to like recall... Mm -hmm. All come from disc, disc one, one, not from anything after that is his point here, I think. That's fine. That's fine. But that's our intro to characters, and that is most of the strongest like points made that set up the story are from disc one. Like one of the examples of this um, is the marketing and generally speaking, people who have played the games and whatnot, but like Skyrim, think of Skyrim and the way that they always market and show 
the character was with like level one armor, like early, early game armor, basically. Mm-hmm. And it's like you get past like cloud with the buster sword. That's yeah. probably a better mm-hmm. example. That's great. It's like, example. if you're going to remember cloud, you're going to remember disc one cloud because that's yeah. where he's got the freaking buster sword. All right. Yeah, and right. every, ever since you leave Midgar, you never use that sword again, right? You <laughs> never use it again because it's weak, but that's what he has that, that would, if you were to have a late game memory of cloud, you you would imagine him as you first saw him, your first impression, mm. the early impression That's of true. him him with the Buster Sword. That's true. <clears throat> uh, well, I guess here it says, we see some shots of Renoa floating in space. That was post-disc one. And then we're back in the ballroom looking for Renoa. Oh, gosh. Then there's another <laughs> assortment of shots from throughout the first disc of the game. First, we see the mechanical spider monster from the final exam in Balam, yeah. followed by a shot of each of the party members but Squall. Quistus, Zell, uh, Renoa, Selfie, and Irvine in that order. The images of Quistus, Zell, and Selfie are from the final exam in Balam. And the shot of Irvine is from his introductory FMB clip. This is the shot of Renoa. So it's this. Uh, what what part is that? I can't really tell. He's probably about to explain <gasps> it. Oh, she's behind. That's Ultimissia behind her. That, that weird like half oh. circle thing, remember? Yeah. yeah that yeah. was like her... Anyways. This frame yeah. is taken directly from the scene in which Squall was killed. Yeah, yeah. Renoa is turning to Squall, who was just who had just been impaled. We see some shots of the Balam communications tower, the Ragnarok, and there's a clip of Renoa still blurred with her hair in the wind. A shot of Cypher pushing Renoa, and Adele goes by. Then we see more of the Balam tower and a clip of Renoa reaching Squall from the parade float. There's an okay. He's going to keep explaining. Okay, well, let's get to the point here. At this point in the movie. And for the last few minutes as well, Squall's life has literally been flashing before his eyes, and I feel there is a particular focus on the two main events of Disc 1, huh. the final exam at Balam and the encounter with Idea on the parade float. But of course, the ballroom scene, which was of particular importance to Squall, is by far the most covered event in the first half of the ending FMV. Right, that's true. <clears throat> However, He keeps coming back to it. Yeah. However, as I've been mentioning, but it's because where he met Renoa. Right, However, right. as I've yeah, been yeah. mentioned, which totally. just goes along with what you it's just said. It's a big deal. We celebrate yeah. anniversaries and we remember, first we commemorate times. the first time yeah. of for things. That's yes, what we do. Yeah. Absolutely. However, as I've been mentioning throughout this section, there are also snippets of images from the latter half of the game, particularly Renoa in space. <laughs> At the very end of this part of the ending movie, we see Renoa coming toward the camera, arms open for embrace. That was also post disc one. Um, as before, the closer she gets, the more obscured she becomes. Then we see our first shot of Squall, and he's got that, like, empty face. Oh, whoa, I was, don't remember that, actually. Huh. This was actually part of the imagery of the final form of Ultimisha. She has sort of, like, a hole a in her face, oh, right? So I want... Huh. This shot keeps me up at night, seriously, he thinks it's free. That, that's pretty cool. Um, so far, the best analysis I have for this... Um, screenshot is that Squall feels empty, that he's losing his sense of self and everything that comes with it. He's having trouble visualizing his memories or even remembering reality from fiction. Think back to what Ultimisha said at the end of the last battle. Reflect on your childhood, your sensation, your words, your emotions, time. It will not wait. No matter how hard you hold on, it escapes you. His life is fading from him. You can't hold on forever. Or they just wanted to give me nightmares. Uh, okay, but I agree with that. All that sounds great. That doesn't mean he died in disc one. That means he's dying now. Is but you know that's that's cool. I I like all that stuff actually. Yeah, that's pretty good. I, yeah, there is one last shot of Renoa floating in space. The glass on her space helmet cracks and sends large pointed shards towards the camera. There is a sound like someone being struck by a sword. Uh, we cut to Squall, his eyes wide, a tear escaping him. He throws back his head and is consumed by white. And now finally Squall is dead. We see a white feather fall to the ground and the screen fades to black. The last 10 minutes of FF8's ending are, in the simplest terms, of heaven or some equivalent thereof. Um, the horrible mm. eyes on me. It's not horrible. No, horrible. That was good. I like that song. That song grew on me a lot after that yeah. podcast, by the way. I really yeah. like that song now. Yeah. Uh, Eyes on Me song boots up and we see Renoa wandering around. She finds Squall and holds him, apparently thinking he's dead. The clouds whirl open uh, so the sun can shine through. Pink flower petals swirl. Okay. At the Balan part, we see Cypher and Fujin. He just describes a lot of what the ending is. We all know this. Um, the movie cuts to Laguna. We saw, we saw that. During the credits, they show a home videotype clip 
We know all that. Yeah, this is the dead Zell theory because he, <laughs> he he ate all those hot dogs. He, he choked. He choked. He to choked. Death. <laughs> That's I prefer the, the dead Zell theory. <laughs> Zell is dead theory personally, but you know whatever. Um, after the final credits, we get to see the stuff that makes the fans go wild. Renoa stands out on the garden's balcony with Squall under the starry night sky. She raises a finger, just as Squall remembers, and Squall smiles back at her. Um, one last thing. And then his conclusion, and then we'll be done with this one. Okay, okay. If this was really how the game was meant to be interpreted, why did they make the dream so subtle? I guess he's asking that of his that If I'm right, okay. If yeah. you, they're, they're asking him this question. Yes, yes, really. yes. I can think of 50 ways to make it more apparent to the audience that the events taking place after Disc 1 are not real. So if the creators meant for Squall to die, they also meant for his death to be obscured and subtle. We view the dream as if we are the dreamers, and even though sometimes events take place that could occur, ever happen in the... Wait. We view the dream as if we are the dreamers, and even though sometimes events take place that could occur... Um, I think he messed up again here. I'm trying to piece together what he really means by this. Hmm. Ever happen in the real world, we do not become aware that it is a dream. I'm not sure what he's trying to say. I think he made a mistake with Writing that. It's not clear. The dream and reality meshes together? I guess so. A similar plot can be seen in the film Vanilla Sky, just for your information. If you haven't mm, seen it, is that don't Tom Cruise? read on. Yes. You saw it. I, I, I watched that with Landon one time. Oh, yeah? And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think bo either of us liked it. Okay. But the thing is, I, I don't necessarily say that to say it's a bad movie because yeah. there's a lot of bad movies or movies I thought were bad. That I went back and watched years later and thought they were yeah. actually good. So okay. um, one Perfect. being um, that what what Wachowski movie that oh, we um, all saw that we didn't like. Our lives are not our own. Yeah, um, the best movie trailer to this day that I've ever seen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What was that movie called? Where they they Cloud they, Atlas. Cloud Atlas. Yeah, um, I want to watch it again. We all I do. We all didn't like it. Yeah, and I remember we made like a a, a review of Cloud Atlas on our yeah. like daily vlog oh, channel yeah, we yeah. had for I see vlog vlog channel. <laughs> vlog is a freaking visual effects thing. Um, <laughs> anyway, about how we didn't like it, and yeah. there were a bunch of people arguing with us, uh, yeah, like yeah. disagreeing. Um, and then I saw that movie again. I want to say like three years ago. Yeah. And it, I thought it was awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I want to watch it again now. It was just, oh, you just got to get over um, seeing them dress an Asian person up as a yeah. ginger with freckles. That was and then pretty weird. Having that, that dude be an Asian person that's yeah. with makeup. It was, yeah. just, it was just funny, but. Yeah. Well, you know. There's just weird it, stuff, but the idea, what they were trying to do, I didn't catch the vision. Yeah. And I think I can now. Yeah. Um, a similar plot can be seen in the film Vanilla Sky, in which Tom Cruise plays a character who chooses to have himself put to sleep. At a certain point in the movie, he begins dreaming, and the entire remainder of the film is a fabrication of his mind. So he, he's kind of just taking... He's saying, some movies do imagery. this, so this is what FF8 did. Yeah, or <laughs> yes. he's seeing similarities yeah. in the presentation of some things, going, oh, that must be gotcha. what it is. Now, Vanilla Sky was... Later, and so was Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind. Those both came out after Final Fantasy FF8, right? Yeah. Okay, they did. Sure. That's a good point to bring up. Yeah. At first, there is little indication that anything is amiss. The plot continues as though nothing is different, except for, of course, that everything starts to go uh, awry or starts to go his way. There we go. And after a while, though, things start to get a little crazy, and he ends up waiting the death penalty for beating his girlfriend to death. <laughs> while experiencing what appeared to be a delusion. And all oh. the while, the audience watches on in confusion, as unaware as the character that this is all just a dream. Now, the problem I had with Vanilla Sky was that they couldn't just leave it alone. I think it would have been a really cool movie if they had just left this up for us to discern what had really happened, which is why he likes Final Fantasy VIII instead, because he, they they, they... he thinks that's what they did. <laughs> <laughs> instead, we, the audience, received a full exposition dump in the final moments of the film as a character carefully explains to the protagonist and the audience that the whole movie really was just a dream. So he's saying that movie was on the nose, so I didn't like that they did that at the end. Uh -huh. And this this one, uh, yeah. so I'm in the brain of Yoshinori Kitase, so I yeah. know that it wasn't that way. <laughs> Maybe the only real Very difference nice. between Final Fantasy VIII and Vanilla Sky is they just never told us what really happened. Though, to be fair, that is kind of the style of this particular team. They do like yeah. to leave a lot of things up to interpretation. Okay, right. A lot of things. So they kind of, they, they ask for things like this. Yes. It is, yeah. 
Okay, conclusion. This is the end. The truth is, I don't think there is a substantial amount of evidence to conclude whether or not the writers intended for the audience to interpret the game in this fashion. Ooh, very nice. I choose to believe that this is how the game was intended to be understood because, to me, the game makes no sense otherwise. Everything that happens to the characters after the first disc is ridiculous. The ending is like recapping the game on acid. There has to be something more to the story than a simple hero-takes-all plot. Sometimes... While writing this article, I really felt that this is the real story of Final Fantasy VIII. But sometimes it all just sounds like poppycock to me. In any case, I think Squall's Dead is an interesting theory, worth considering at least, and I hope you think so too. Well, that is correct. I love the conclusion. He becomes a lot softer there. Um, yeah. Uh, it is interesting. It's very interesting. I don't agree with that particular theory and how it's all put together. Yeah. But I'm open to the concept. I, somebody told me a little while ago that that's it's possible to look at Zelda Majora's Mask as uh, the death dream, uh, sure, or the of Link, the death journey yeah. of Link. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, after he fell through that hole. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I think that I, one. Like, I would I would subscribe to that. Sure. For that game, a lot more so than this one. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, but the thing is, Final Fantasy VIII. Like he's saying that if if the Squall's Dead theory is wrong then FF8 is like a bad game. Yes. Right. And I'm no saying sense. it's actually yeah. like a really good game and you don't need to do that to make it yeah. good. You don't need to do, you don't need to create this theory in order to make it good. I now, agree. I do also have to say it, it is kind of interesting. It is interesting to propose the idea that Squall might be dead. And there, there are some like reasonable points that he's made there that mm. I can say, okay, interesting. That would be kind of interesting if they did that. Right. Mm. That would be kind of cool. But I don't like that he did this as an excuse to try to get around the fact that he thinks the game makes no sense, yeah. which, which can be said about FFA to some extent. But I think if you it, this would be said by somebody who didn't dig hard enough into the actual game to try to understand what it is and instead preemptively a little yeah. ahead of time, prematurely decided to um, craft Explain this theory away. about how, OK, the game's good now. I OK, good. Oof. The game's good. Okay. <laughs> Oof, man, I thought the game was bad for a second there, but it turns out Squall died, and okay, now it's a good game, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't like the reason for doing it, I guess, because yeah. it's a good game on its own. Just, just there's stuff that you missed, apparently. Well, I think that's a very good point to bring up. One, because a lot of the things I think he's trying to respond to, mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm assuming it, this person's like, a guy, but it could, yeah, I don't know who it is. Maybe. But, it's like online forum critiques back yes. 20 years ago, right? And, and I had a lot of the same exact critiques or problems with the game my first time playing it yeah the thing sure, is i've sure. played the game five times now i did a podcast it on it time, in which right? <laughs> and on which we really dove into a lot of the the sort of surrounding yeah uh things that a lot of people don't see on a first playthrough yeah. reading through all those logs and talking to all these npcs and yeah. talking to our audience who they noticed things we didn't notice and when you pull all of that together there's actually a lot of good explanations for the yeah. things that seem ridiculous right. or that uh, didn't make sense on the surface level. For instance, the orphanage scene being one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't that uh, it wasn't explained at all. It just wasn't explained at all in any of the main story cutscenes like or something. Yeah. But and it's not yeah. just it's not just the fact that the um, that they forget because they're using these magical rocks. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's also the fact that Sid is kind of orchestrating a lot of this. Yes, and so is um, Idea to some extent, maybe even subconsciously. But also, so is um, oh, there was another person. Um, wasn't there another person involved who was helping <sighs> things happen? Uh, Laguna. I mean, well, yes, to some yes, extent. yes, yeah. yes, on his own. Yeah. And then the scientist, but one of the leaders of the other gardens, but I think he ended up being on the bad side, but he kind of knew about yeah, this, I mean, right? The, Which one was it? It was e Ivan. Ivan. I always called him Ivan. Oh, Irvine? Irvine. Because he didn't forget. Remember? Yeah. Because he didn't start using GFs that's until it, much that's later. It. And so yeah. he's kind of like approaching this and moving towards these people in a way that's, uh, but th this has all been orchestrated kind of on purpose, I guess. Um, and and the, you pair that along with the forgetting things all the time stuff. 
Um, and it's not that weird, right? Yeah. Because when I first played it, I was like, oh, it just so happened because they talk about fate a lot. They say, oh, yeah. the fates put us together. It's like, yeah, yes, yes. But through a people who actually knew what was going on. <laughs> and those people put you together. And yeah. that's why all this happened. That's why Squall became the leader of the garden. And that's why all of this stuff happened. And that's why Sid is like taking a back seat. Like it doesn't make sense when you first, you know, play the game. But when you understand like uh, what exactly is happening here, it's actually kind of cool. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, this all was able to be planned because Ultimatia is able to, from the future, like take over the bodies of past sorceresses, right? Yeah. So like Idea was being possessed by Ultimatia from the future, saw some things that were to come or like yes. got into her mind, right, right. which is why she, she and Sid Set started things setting things in motion. Yeah, yeah. So like, it, yeah, it, it does make sense. It's not like there's the, the game does. I, as far as I can remember, I don't think there's anything in the game that's left without any explanation. Whether you like the explanation or not <laughs> right, right, right. is different story. But like there is an explanation for it. It's not right. completely out of left field or ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, there's probably no need to concoct this sort of theory that's, to that's make my it come together. It. it may well be true. It's not, actually, because <laughs> like Katasi said it's not. But, you know, it may well be fun and interesting to think about, uh, but it's just unnecessary. It's very yeah. unnecessary for a good game to ha for you to craft something like that. They'll be like, uh, I don't know, like, gosh, what's a really good game that everyone loves? Everyone loves... Mario Brothers. Mario Brothers, sure. <laughs> Mario's dead. <laughs> oh, that's why mushrooms. That's stupid. Mushrooms don't go. make sense. Mushrooms are stupid. Why turtles? Why are you jumping on turtles? Oh, he died, and this is his death grip. <laughs> now it all makes sense. You know, like you can do that with almost anything. Sure. If you're having a hard time accepting it or, or justifying why you like something, it's almost the you may easiest feel the need. way. To yeah, try to yeah. explain something weird. The sixth, the sixth Sense ruined everyone. <laughs> Everybody. Everybody. I remember there's an episode of is it Parks and Rec where um, the guy, I can't remember his name, the actor, um, he's like, uh, every time he guesses, he tries to guess the end of every movie that he watches yeah. uh, with his girlfriend. And like 80% of the time, he's like, oh, he was dead the whole time. And it's like, <laughs> that's like his go-to thing. It's really funny. Uh, Chris Pratt, that's the guy. Yeah. But right. here, I have one more thing. Or do you have okay. another? Is there well, another I was, was going to move on to the uh, Ultimatia and Renoa thing. Oh, okay. But, I do uh, want to have one more thing that pertains to this. And that is the idea of a journey after death just in general. Mm -hmm. um, if, if some things about that theory line up with what people could commonly perceive as something like a death journey, um, it's because that's actually an archetype that a lot of stories follow. A lot of stories will follow something of like... Uh, um, like this is the old Egyptian book of the dead or the Tibetan book of the dead, which sure. is what uh, Jacob's ladder is based on. Yeah, it's based that, on that. that. There's a whole journey, even, even ancient religion, like um, the Orthodox, the Catholic Christian religions have this, uh, this concept of like the 40 days after you die, that there's like this kind of journey that you kind of, and Dante's Inferno, but like, sure. there's so much uh, of, of just modern storytelling that comes from the ideas of what happens after you die? That's like the big question of like all of humanity, basically. And and um, a lot of our stories are trying to address that. And like, oh, when you die, there's this whole there's this whole journey that happens, right? And some of it might even be DMT based. And then <laughs> people come back and they tell the stories and it resonates. And then people yeah. dream about this stuff. And then it's like, wow. And dreaming is kind of like dying anyways. Like sleeping is equated to to death, at least the ancients would say, like the long sleep. That was that was how they would describe somebody who's dead, you know? And, yeah. Um, you know, a Annie Lennox song from Into the West, You're Only Sleeping, right, from mm -hmm. uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, anyways, it's, it's like the idea of a journey after death is so archetypal and so many movies and stories will incorporate those ideas into their story, but it doesn't mean that your main character is dead. Yeah. It doesn't right. mean that. Uh, usually they'll take those ideas and they'll put it in there because it's interesting and it's something that everybody thinks about. But that doesn't mean that that's literally what's, what's happening, happening. You know, it's story. just, yeah. but so you'll find those elements, you know, and the DMT dreams and all that. Yeah. But so many movies and stories do it because it resonates because we all have these questions and we all dream. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, you, you just don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. Just because all the elements are there doesn't mean your main character is, has been dead the whole time. Yeah. M. Night Shyamalan curses. <laughs> Okay, let's go. All right. So this one, at least from what I remember of it back when I was kind of first looking into it, this one for me was a little bit more like, hmm, that might actually be pretty sweet yeah. than the other one we just went through. So, I've always felt Squall is Dead is kind of 
nah, I'm not really into that. That doesn't do it for it, me. Which is unnecessary, yeah. right? But whereas this weird Ultimacia time compression stuff, I do have questions about that. Sure. And I would love a, a, a fan theory about why that is, to make that a little more palatable. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Where do I mean the Let me see where they actually start explaining this. Before diving into the theory, some primer makes understanding the evidence a little bit more digestible. In Final Fantasy VIII, a small group of women known as sorceresses can wield near incomprehensible magic abilities and transcend mortality. One is not born a sorceress, but rather is passed down from one to another. Not all sorceresses are evil, but they're still feared by people and often forced to the edges of society. There's um, right, a whole right. backstory to this with Hein, I think we went through, who was like the first, he was like sort of almost godlike. Yeah. And he fell asleep and like the That's sorceresses right. were like That's supposed right. to be tending to the world and then he woke up. So you might yeah. have to go back to our Final Fantasy VIII um, podcast where we talked about that thing in the final episode. But anyway. Well, the, the concept, that's the God rested on the seventh day, and that's yeah. when Lucifer... Oh, shoot. No, whatever. Yeah, just keep going. There, <laughs> okay. there's, there's other parables. Uh, sorceresses usually take on a male guardian known as a knight who swears to keep the sorceress safe regardless of personal cost. Both sorceresses and knights often utilize summoned entities called guardian forces in addition to their own strength. Guardian forces are magically summoned beings that wield uh, and can imbue impressive powers to their summoners but they gradually cause memory loss to those who frequently call upon their might. Which is funny because the first time I played Final Fantasy VIII, I basically just used GF the, in every fight the whole game. <laughs> <laughs> I basically just summoned to beat everything, uh -huh. which is not the optimal way to play, but I thought it was. Uh, both Squall and Renoa use Guardian forces throughout Final Fantasy VIII. Okay. Uh, Twisted Sorceress. The theory suggesting Renoa becomes Ultimecia hinges on a few different pieces of evidence players noticed in Final Fantasy VIII. Ultimecia herself is a sorceress from an undisclosed time in the future with aspirations to compress time into a singularity. Her backstory and motivations beyond this goal are left vague, which is uncharacteristic of Final Fantasy villains. At about halfway through the game, Renoa becomes a sorceress and takes Squall as her knight. Renoa often laments about the uncertainty of her future as a sorceress, saying that she'd preferably maintain the life she has in the present with Squall. She even goes as far as to contemplate her demise at the hands of her friends. I guess it's okay if it's you, Squall, no one else. Um, oh, friends as in, like, friends possessive, as in, in, in um, Squall's hands. Okay. Not like all of them. So she, it's okay if Squall is the one to do it. Because hmm. Squall is the one who's fated to kill this Ultimatia right. in the future. So, oh, okay. If, if, it ha if I have to die, at least it's from you. So they're taking that line as if she's aware of the fact that Squall is going to be the one to have to kill her. Interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did I explain that well yeah, enough? Yeah, no, I so think you did. She, the, yeah. the fact that she says, I guess it's okay if it's you, Squall, no one else, is some hint at the fact that she's aware she's going to become Ultimatia and that he's ultimately going to be the one to kill her. Very interesting. Renoa's wishes to stay in the present where she's happy with Squall sound eerily similar to Ultimecia's plans to compress time into a singular point. This creates the basis for the theory. Renoa outlives her friends and Squall with her sorceresses and uh, her friends and Squall with her sorceress's longevity. So she outlives all of her friends, slowly descending into madness from grief and adverse mental effects associated with using guardian forces over a long period of time. Okay. Uh, let's see. Another reinforcing element of the theory is Ultimatia's guardian force, Griever. Um, so this oh, is I interesting. Did I did. I did. Okay. I do. So I'm you, aware of this. You one, remember this one? I do. Oh, this is years ago. Naming is significant to Final Fantasy creators and always yes. bears a more profound meaning than just the character's name. For example, not always, and especially with summons, <laughs> right? Right? Because sure. you'll have. Um, They're not uh, mythologically accurate. Yeah, they'll be named that way, yeah. but they often will not actually be re representing. Reflect that. the myth. Yeah, like Shiva is a male deity sure. in, in India. In, in and, India. And yeah. is a very different in Final Fantasy. Okay, yeah. keep going. For example, Renoa's dog is named Angelo and refers uh, references her angelic nature and demeanor. Uh, Griever resembles a lion and 
iconography that is tied to Squall in both his name and the ring he wears. Right. Remember she asks for that I ring? That. Yeah, yeah. In, right. uh, they have that big battle, and we were both like, yeah. why are you talking about this? Like, people are freaking dying well, she's gonna, you 50 know. yards over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, dude, the romance is, like, number yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. The theory suggests the Guardian Force is a manifestation of Ultimicia's grief following Squall's death and thus takes the form connected with her knight. So this is part of... The Squall is Dead theory? No, this is part of the Ultimicia and Renault are the same person theory. Oh, okay. After so, Squall's death, I see. In, his, in, of his... natural causes, and she outlives everybody because uh, she's a sorceress, uh, and she go. loses all of her memories okay, and be, turns into sense. Ultimicia in the future. Yeah, Some gotcha, undisclosed gotcha, 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 gotcha. future. Yeah. Is it 50 years? Is it 500 years? We right. don't know. Yeah. But if it's 50 years, this could be her as okay. the sorceress of from the future having forgot a lot of stuff because she uses guardian forces, but like her guardian force is some manifestation of Squall, her love from when she was a teenager. Okay. Interesting. That's what this is saying. Yeah, that's Supporting good. this theory is a major quest in the game focusing on the ring. In a moment where Squall speaks to Renoa about his idea of strength, he gifts her the ring, which he says is a creature called Griever. So, he gave his ring, calls it Griever to Renoa, but Ultimicia yeah. has Griever as a guardian force. Yeah. And, How does that and, make sense unless she is Ultimicia? Right. And, is and the just the idea, once again, that Renoa, during the middle of a battle, thought it was so important to get this thing that she can like, yes, make a ring. copy. She made a yes. copy of it, right? Or is something that what she like does? That. She like, gets a mold of it or something? Oh, yes, you wanted to make so they could both have one or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. I like, believe that's like some correct. kind of promise yes, ring everyone... or something. I, I don't remember the details because I just remember thinking it was absurd that, that she was yeah. focusing on it's, this. It's absurd <laughs> when unless... When people are dying <laughs> all around you. Unless you're Ultimicia and you're like, hey, um, oh, this is yeah. the perfect time. Sure. To, or any time, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like All time. I'm, I'm Ultimicia. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, hey, give me that ring. I, we got stuff to do. I don't know when you're going to die, but it's going to be some point. And we're in the middle of a battle. You might die soon. So... Uh, like, give me your keepsakes. Squall only spoke about this to Renoa and no one else. When her knight fell, did Renoa create a new guardian in the form of her love's symbol of strength? Okay. Maybe. Next point of evidence is seeds of the future. The, the theory's biggest problem is that it would go against Square Enix's general desire to ensure titles at the time left players with a cheerful ending. Even though Square... That's not true. Final Fantasy VII had a very ambiguous ending. Final Fantasy mm, VI, yes, it like, did. all the freaking yes, espers disappear, and, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. all magic disappears from the world. It's, yep. like, a super depressing ending. What are you talking about? <laughs> I was depressed by it, but some people would say that <laughs> well, that was a good Well, I just mean, thing. like, uh, the world still is destroyed at the end of Final yeah, Fantasy VI. You're right, and you're like, right, you're right. Like, it, it's not but, like but they you fixed do see, everything. You see some birds flying Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, like, the um, <laughs> it's like, okay, we overcame Kefka, and yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a, a hope for or yeah. something new to come from this. But, like, the world that they knew, was it's gone and destroyed, and yeah. all the magic disappears, and the espers go away. Yeah, I feel like Xenogear is something similar. Yeah. It's like, so I, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't know what this person's talking about. Uh, a lot of these endings were, especially of the, the ones directly preceding this game, were not necessarily happy endings. Um, let's see. There's also the matter of Ultimicia not being able to read Squall's mind and access his memories without reacting to what would surely stir up some emotions. She'd seen memories of Renoa and Squall, and if the theory were correct, memories that actually be herself in Squall. Wait, did I miss a line there? Even though Square titles... Are... They'd almost always end with an upbeat note for characters involved. Okay, never mind. Um, perhaps most damning for this theory, though, is that the game's director, Yoshinori Kitase, has gone on record debunking the theory. He stated, no, that is not true. I don't think I'll incorporate that even if we do make a <laughs> remake of the game. But okay, so being, Kitase rejected this one? He, he not only rejected it, but said, I yeah. probably wouldn't use that in so remake he does, either. He doesn't even like it. <laughs> Yeah, But that being said, both Renoa and Ultimicia are witches, so in that sense they are similar, but they are not the same person. Though the title's director officially deflated the theory, many connections are difficult to explain away. It's certainly possible the theory points to a direction Square initially intended for the fate, but ultimately, no, no, because he said right, yeah, right, he, not. Sa he said yeah. no. <laughs> if that's the case, it's unlikely Square will ever admit to it, and Renoa and Ultimicia's connection will forever remain uncorroborated anyway okay 
Well, those are the two uh, biggest ones. That one's interesting because it does resolve some issues <laughs> sure. that are that are very interesting. Uh, it does change the game's ending, but that's fine. Like mm-hmm. I don't think that's that big of a deal. And um, I would well, I would welcome a theory like that because I would feel it more necessary. Yeah. Now, as for the Squall is Dead theory, the writer of the theory felt that a theory was necessary. I just happen to disagree. Yeah, there's right? no need for it. So whether or not place. I like your theory, <laughs> it does depend on whether or not I think it's necessary. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think that I think that's a good point that I might have thought before we did our big podcast on the game yeah. that there was a need for something to fill in gaps. But after having done our podcast, I really don't think that's the case. I don't think so either. I think so, it's, yeah. I think the game stands just fine in its yeah. own in-text explanations for things. It's not necessary to explain them away. Yeah. They aren't actually ridiculous. Well, as ridiculous <laughs> as they at first seem. It, it's okay to be a little ridiculous, you know? Sure. I mean, the world needs some spice. Sure. But once again, just like with Mario, it's like, oh, I have a theory that Mario's dead. Like, okay. <laughs> And like it cha- it doesn't, it just doesn't, you're not, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. You know? It just doesn't do anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, we did, a, we had a whole diatribe at the end of that <laughs> podcast about how we don't like fan theories. And uh, people, people we were like, please, please do it. And we didn't do it because I really, I honestly don't like fan theories. Um, <laughs> but uh, now yeah. you get your, your wish is granted. We yeah. did it. We did it. We did it. Two or three years later, but we finally did it. Yep. Uh, I I still think the game is better without the theories, but I I kind of do like <laughs> yeah. I kind of do like that tie of Griever being the GF of Ultimatia. That does seem kind of strange. It's like what else? I, I suppose you could say uh, you don't have to explain away explain it away with Renoa. You can explain it away as Ultimatia's entire freaking character that uh, of which we know is the yeah. fact that she is aware a person named squall is going to kill me so her obsession of this guy who is represented by the griever it does kind you of know, can does still lend work some, you do, it doesn't yeah. have to be explained yeah. as renoa yeah um it can be explained as she has a different reason for being obsessed with squall and that <laughs> some of that imagery might uh, manifest itself yeah. for that reason so Final Fantasy VIII doesn't need theories. Is essentially what I've come game. to the conclusion of yeah, at the yeah. end of this. Good, the story, good games don't need the theories. The story does not require any explanation of this kind to make yeah. sense. It makes sense on its own already. Yeah, it makes enough sense on its own. Enough already. sense on its own. Enough, and that's it. You can't you can't set your threshold too, threshold too high <laughs> to where you have to kill your main character in order to have it make sense. <laughs> like just lower the bar a little bit, you know. <laughs> just don't don't be so uh, yeah. you know don't be so rigid. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that. Hope it was worth the three-year wait for us to talk about it. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Peace out. Yeah, and tell us if you dream of cell phones. Oh, yeah. Peace. We, didn't, we need to know. Bye. We need to know. <laughs>